Welcome to Ascend Life on the Autism Spectrum. Today our program is a psychiatrist in autism with our guest, Dr. Linda Lotspeech of Stanford University. I'm Keith Halperin. I'm Will Burnick. Okay. And before we begin, what's with your NASA t-shirt? F- funny you should ask that, because this this episode shirt is an is my NASA sh- is my NASA shirt. It it represents space and 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 astrophysics. I, I got I got from from I got from Texas from my aunt and uncle. I and next next year marks the 50th anniversary of the moon landing by Neil Armstrong. So so this episode will commemorate that anniversary. Very appropriate. Very appropriate. Well, Will, would you now like to begin with Dr. Lot's speech? Uh, as as soon as possible. Lin- Linda Lot speech. Can you tell us about your background and how you came to work with families in our autism community? Yes, thank you, Will. Um, <coughs> I came to uh, work <coughs> with uh, autism um, when I was in college. And at that time, I was studying to be a teacher uh, in special education. However, my interest goes all the way back to elementary school uh, when I was in uh, the sixth grade. And uh, they cleared out the first floor of the school to bring in a whole group of kids who couldn't hear. They were deaf. And I got a chance to be a big sister with some sixth graders as well as um, be a, um, a helper for the preschool class. And I became fascinated with how you learn to talk when you can't hear. That was a, a real challenge, I thought. And so I learned a lot from the kids there. Um, I myself was having problems reading and I was later diagnosed with dyslexia. So I think I was always interested in language, reading, and talking. So when I went to college, I went to the University of Cincinnati in a program to become a teacher of people who are deaf. Um, And then I met a child with um, autism, and that was even more challenging because this was a six-year-old boy who couldn't speak, but it wasn't as easy as the understanding of the cause as coming from being deaf, but instead it was um, the fact that they had autism and we're talking around 1972. So back then, um, they really didn't understand the causes of autism and they still have difficulties. So from there, I went off and taught for about five years, uh, kids with autism, also kids with a variety of conditions, deaf, blind, physically handicapped. I was very fortunate to learn from all those kids. And, uh, And in my fifth year of teaching, I really wanted to understand what was the cause of autism. So I decided very simplistically, I would go into medicine with that question. (laughs) What's the cause of autism? I've now sensed that I understand better why we still don't understand what the cause of autism is. But I went ahead and went into medicine at the University of Cincinnati, came out to Stanford for residency, and came on faculty. I've done research in the early days in the 1990s in genetics and neuroimaging, trying to answer that question. But I found that really my passion and love was working with the families. So uh, I stopped doing the research and I've continued to work clinically ever since. Can you tell us about your current work as a psychiatrist with families in our autism community? Yes. So that work has transitioned um, over the years, Um, uh, but what I spend most of my time doing now is um, doing what I call parent counseling. I support parents in understanding uh, their kids uh, with autism, uh, mostly in middle school, high school, and a few young adults. I find that I'm a translator. Uh, I like to help parents understand the kids' behaviors, uh, particularly with the individuals uh, who are mildly infected in the Asperger range. Parents get very frustrated in some of their behaviors, and I try to help them understand where those behaviors are coming from. 
Can you tell us about your affiliation with Stanford's University Neuro Neurodiversity's of efforts? Yes, yeah, so a couple years ago, Stanford started a neurodiversity program. Um, it's chaired by uh, my colleague, Dr. Uh, Lawrence Fung, and he, in a very short time, has really worked with various areas of Stanford uh, to develop this program. It has a few branches to it. The first branch was to um, work with the, uh, the university IT program, um, and they have agreed to um, hire uh, some individuals with autism. Um, I think they're either just started hiring or within weeks of doing that. And so that's been the major effort. Um, we work with an organization called Neuropathways. I think you recently had a job club uh, with Ranga, if I'm correct. Um, uh, and so that's one branch. The other branch is starting to work with the, um, the office at Stanford that supports students with various um, uh, needs and wanting to make sure that their modification is appropriate mm -hmm. for autistic students that come to Stanford, both graduate and undergraduate. And then the third branch that I'm aware of is um, Dr. Fung, who is uh, both an adult and child psychiatrist. He's in the process of developing a clinic in our adult psychiatry clinic to uh, care for adults because most of the individuals we see uh, with autism are in the child psychiatry clinic. And, and because our patients grow up, we frequently still care for adults because we started with them as kids. But we don't take in new patients as adults. Can you tell us about some of the issues that the uh, parents deal with and how you advise them? Sure. Um, one of the most common issues that come up is um, homework and academic uh, performance. So um, many autistic uh, students, um, they may be very bright and can handle the academic requirements, but they don't have the organizational skills, the executive functioning skills. Mm -hmm. And so that contributes to poor academics. Another one is motivation. That I've talked to many um, uh, adolescents with autism who doing well in school is not high on their priority. Mm -hmm. um, and I've learned a lot from those discussions, actually. Um, so when I talk with parents around their concerns of homework not getting done or grades going down, the first thing I try to do is to help them understand all the things that may be contributing to it. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is that I talk a lot about um, letting the kids just experience natural consequences so that if they don't get the homework done and they don't turn it in, their grades will go down. Just to see whether that matters to them or not because now we're tapping into where the motivation is. Um, that's very hard for a lot of parents mm -hmm. to do. Um, and a lot of autistic students, they do need support. They do need parents to be more involved. And so what I do is I really try to individualize and work with each family to kind of find that sweet spot. But frequently I'm talking about dropping the expectations mm -hmm. and monitoring. Mm -hmm. The other thing that has been my experience, um, there's no research behind it, but it seems to me that a lot of students who are, um, they attend regular education mm -hmm. classes. What most kids in, um, uh, neurotypical kids in uh, middle school accomplish, autistic kids will do in high school and then off. So that I've yeah. helped myself not be so nervous that we have to get everything set up fast or by the time they turn 18 and allow a natural um, process. It sounds as if that much of what you deal with are the parents trying to figure out how to get the autistic child to modify their behavior. And I'm curious about how much of the work you do with the parents actually involves sort of the, the emotional aspects of having an autistic child or children? Could you tell us about that? Yes, I do. And that part is, um, 
is occurring throughout all these discussions. And I'm very attentive to what the parents are saying and where their level of frustration is. And I wanna validate um, their frustrations because it can be very challenging at times, if not very, very stressful. Um, what I also offer is um, I teach uh, mindfulness meditation to mm -hmm. parents. I'm, um, I'm in process, it's an eight week course. I'm teaching um, the eighth course. I developed my own mindfulness practice um, about 15 uh, years ago. And after I had um, developed it further, I knew I wanted to bring it into my work. And so that's another way with some of the parents, and many of the parents I work with now have taken my class. So we'll actually meditate for a few minutes at the beginning of each session. Mm, very interesting. Stacey, I understand you have a question. I, uh, you know, I was thinking back to, you know, when you said you help out parents, like understand their kid more and, and also just let them just naturally, um, how would you say, you know, if they know something should get done and they don't do it, that type of thing? Or I um, have you experienced with those that, uh, who, um, kids who pretty much like are always good about doing their homework, they're very organized, but the homework is just so hard like to do. And for sure, I, some experience with mine, I mean, my parents wanted to help me, they just didn't know how or so. But, right. um, but I mean, obviously, it sounds like that. Uh, that's what you like do these days. You help parents, you know, uh, understand them and understand their like academics, like or so. Um, do Do you see a lot of um, kids these days like str like struggle with homework, or is it a little better? Like, yeah, I see the whole range. So, the range, yeah. Um, yeah. so having um, been a special education teacher mm -hmm, has mm -hmm. really helped me as a psychiatrist. So when I'm talking to parents about homework, particularly in the beginning, mm -hmm. I will start, ask a lot of questions yeah. and wanna get results of any previous testing because one of the things that I'm trying to decide, mm -hmm. is it just executive functioning, you know, different motivation? Or is there a learning disability? And I already mentioned I have dyslexia myself, and uh -huh. so <clears throat> I know what it's like to have a learning disability, uh -huh. and I remember when I was in school. So um, uh, yes, and then there's a fourth thing, which is a little bit more amorphous, but I talk to uh -huh. parents a lot about it, and that is that I think a lot of things that autistic individuals do, um, it takes more effort. It's just harder. And I talk about, you know, kids going off to school, and schools are one of the most social environments. I remember mm -hmm. the last time you've walked down the hall of a middle mm -hmm. school. Mm -hmm. I was amazed. I mean, I walk down the hall at Stanford all the time, and I'm not bombarded by all these people. And so I think that by the time a kid has gone through school, they've put out so much effort. I talk about an effort bucket. Mm -hmm. Their bucket is empties out faster. And so before they can even come home and even think about homework, they need to take a break. The yes. other thing, um, and this is where I can get on a roll and I won't keep going on, okay. but homework is best done at school or at a library. I, uh, I don't remember the author, but I have this little book in my office. It was written by an adolescent. He said, the problem with homework is it's done at home. Yeah. And I think for a lot of kids, it's better to get the homework done elsewhere, yeah. and they may need some tutoring and help. Well, you had another question. What are some of the, what are some of the, uh, what are some of the issues that frustrate parents? Okay, well, um, Homework is one, and we talked about that. Another issue is behaviors. Uh, a lot of autistic kids, when they get angry, they can get aggressive, and they can um, be scary, particularly when they get bigger. And so parents are worried that they may get hit or somebody else may get hit. Jennifer, I understand you have a question as well. Yes. I myself didn't experience any academic problems until high school, but okay, how do I segue into this? But 
the whole time I was in school, I was getting the message that whatever autistic behaviors I was showing at the time were purely socially constructed. Not only that, but it was a horrible tragedy that the school wasn't able to socially construct everyone else to be like me, because in a lot of ways, autistic kids do make ideal students. They're highly intelligent. They study in class instead of socializing every teacher's dream, right? But why is it so hard for the schools in particular and society in general to accept that this is not socially constructed. You are not going to be able to socially construct every kid in your class to have Asperger's. So can you please give up trying and start paying some attention to the kids who already have Asperger's? Yes, um, we do hear about that. Uh, and so, um, one, I just want to acknowledge the frustration, and this is part of the translation that I try to do. So not only will I work with parents, I will on occasion um, uh, talk to people at school and to help them understand uh, what autism is and to um, not misinterpret words that are said or behaviors that are expressed by autistic individuals. We're 18 years, almost 19 years into the 21st century why do the schools still need you to do that? Why don't they get it already? Well, I don't absolutely know for sure, but here are a few ideas that I have. Um, and, and it's helpful because I worked in the schools. And so the difference of when I worked in the schools to what I do now is that what I do now, I get to specialize. I get to know a lot about autism. And really, uh, as the title says, be in autism where when I was a teacher, I had to know a lot about everything. So schools have to set up accommodations and work and understand all students with all differences. And I think that's a real challenge, um, not only in the schools, but other of our institutions. And so that's why you know there is more movement towards more diversity, but we still need a lot of work to be done. What kind of work? Is it more funding, more training for the teachers? Uh, what? Uh, both, but I think funding is a big piece because the schools have a limited budget and they are required by law to provide services and they don't have the full range of funds that they probably need to be able to do that and levels of expertise. So during our last program, I discussed a specialized program at a specialized high school for autistic students called Orion Academy. It's absolutely wonderful that we have this program. The problem is there's only one of it and the overwhelming majority of teenagers on the autism spectrum don't have the opportunity to take advantage of this program. So my questions are, number one, why not? And number two, what are we going to do for these kids? Are they just out of luck, too bad, so sad? Yes, so I'm familiar with Orion Academy. I've never visited it, um, excuse me. <clears throat> but um, you're right, they are a program that is solely designed to support uh, autistic students. Um, I do wanna say that I have noticed over the last 10 to 12 years, some of the public schools really devoting more attention to autistic students um, throughout school, but what I'm speaking to right now is in middle school and high school. So these are kids that would be going to regular classrooms, but as you described, because of the differences in the social behaviors, they may get dis, um, ignored or misinterpreted and problems arise. So what these schools do is they have a special class called academic communication classes, some students find them helpful. Some students don't, and they refuse to attend. The other thing the schools have been doing that I think has been very helpful is that they have counselors that the students can meet with and really get to know, and the counselor gets to know the student to really understand that particular student's concerns and be able to problem solve right there in school, which is so great for the parents because when the students come home and complain to the parents, 
then the parents can guide the student to go back and speak with the counselor. What are some of the uh, chief concerns and worries that the parents have uh, about the uh, kids going forward into the future? Well, the common worry that parents are concerned about is they won't be independent. Um, that because of some of their social differences, they might you know, be able to get a job, but might get fired because of some behaviors, or they won't get the work done, or some that, you know, um, uh, parents would like a lot of their kids to go to college and um, are worried that they won't be able to get through. And so because of that, they really feel that before the kids are 18, it's their duty to make sure the kids learn certain things. Mm -hmm. And that's where they start to push um, the kids. And so we talk a lot about this when I meet with the parents. Because on one hand, uh, we do want to ensure independence. Will, I understand you have another question. I do. Tell us about your research interests. So um, in the last 10 years, I've um, moved away from research. I used to be interested, as I mentioned before, in genetics and uh, neurobiology. And so um, my, but I still have interests uh, that I explore. One is um, developing mindfulness for um, parents and also talking to people about developing mindfulness for um, kids and adults. But a new interest of mine, which is one of the reasons why I'm really enjoying being here today, is that I really would like to have opportunities to interact and be with autistic adults. My whole career has been with children. I have a few patients that have grown up and I interact with them, but I interact with them as patients. And I want to be able to explore autism outside of the clinic. Could you mention more about like mindfulness and how it works? Sure. Mm -hmm. So mindfulness is a way of being fully present in the moment. And kind of sounds silly because right now we're always fully present in the moment. But actually we're not. We're frequently caught up in our thoughts. Mm -hmm. The one time you can think about it is if you're ever driving or even as a passenger in the car, you will find that you've gone from point A to B and you don't even remember the roads because you were daydreaming. Mm -hmm. so, um, so mindfulness is to help us train our mind to let go of those thoughts and be in the moment. Now why is that helpful? Well, it turns out that um, we're happier and we're frequently less stressed. Um, it's a little bit more complicated to go into the details of why being mindful mm -hmm. Um, decreases the stress in our lives, but it, it definitely does. Jennifer. So one other question I'd like to ask Linda is a topic we haven't addressed yet, and that is bullying. Many, if not most, children on the autism spectrum have great difficulty mm -hmm. developing age-appropriate social skills. I certainly did, mm -hmm. and that makes them easy marks, sitting ducks for bullying. So what are your thoughts on that? Yes, it happens a lot. I hear about it in the clinic frequently. And um, I'm happy to see that at least over the decades that I've been working in this field, that schools have started to have a um, no tolerance on bullying policies. That doesn't mean it doesn't still happen. There are also programs uh, like Cornerstone um, to address bullying and uh, training kids on what to do when they're bullied, which the number one thing to do is to remove themselves and go find an adult. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any final thoughts? Um, I would just like to say how much I've really enjoyed this morning and speaking with everyone, and mm -hmm. I wish it would go on longer. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure for us as well, mm -hmm. and we hope to have you back sometime if we haven't totally scared you away. <laughs> <laughs> no, you haven't scared me. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Jennifer Brooks, our book correspondent. Thank you, Keith. Before I begin to tell you about today's book, I'd like to tell you about a research study published a few months ago. A 2018 Cambridge University Press online article is pushing back hard on the notion that people with autism are not interested in socializing. The article, 
being versus appearing socially uninterested, challenging assumptions about social motivation in autism, questions the widespread assumption that the primary reason for autistic people's unusual behaviors is that they are not socially motivated. Rather, the authors suggest, their social signals are misunderstood, an insight the authors believe could open the door to more effective interventions. We hope this research will lead to more respectful treatment of people with autism, as well as development of more effective methods of supporting them, said Namira Akhtar, a professor of psychology at UC Santa Cruz, which is my alma mater, who co-authored the paper with lead author Vikram Joswal, an associate professor of psychology at the University of Virginia. Focusing on what autistic people have to say about their own experiences, the authors explore four behaviors that are common among people with autism and offer alternative explanations for each behavior. For more information, you can go to the Cambridge University Press website. You can download the article, but not for free. They do make you pay for it. And now, let me tell you about today's book. It is called The Other Einstein. This is a novel about Einstein's first wife, Mileva, quote, Mitza Marik. I'm sure a lot of our viewers would be surprised to learn that Einstein was married, not just once, but twice. His first wife was a fellow student in Albert Einstein's class at the University of Zurich. She was a brilliant physicist in her own right, but as evidenced by the title of the book, she has been overshadowed by her more famous husband. We know very little about her, which is why this is a novel instead of a biography, because many of the details of this woman's life had to be imagined by the author instead of researched. However, it is a good story about a woman who likely was on the autism spectrum and almost certainly would be diagnosed as being on the autism spectrum if she was in school today. She was a brilliant physics student, but she never, well, we first meet her as a college student. Now we'll hear from uh, Stacey Kennedy, our cultural correspondent. Thanks. Okay, so today uh, I wanted to uh, bring up that um, I've mentioned um, probably monthly or every, every two months or so that there's this weekly dance for all inclusive exercise class in El Camino, uh, at the El Camino YMCA in Mountain View. And that's still going on Saturdays from one to two and um, where you, uh, people can dance side by side. Um, oh, and it's, uh, I wanted to mention, it's hosted by Autism Fun Bay Area. Um, I'm sure you can find out more if you go to their website or you can email them at info.autismfunbayarea at gmail.com. So, yeah, this is a community for all with developmental differences as well as neurotypical families are welcomed too. But this is an experience that is fun and necessary to explore. Uh, November 8th, Saturday, November 8th, is an Autism Speaks walk in Golden Gate Park from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. You can check out their Facebook page um, and let alone their website. I, um, but yeah, Autism Speaks, just check them out. They're going to have a walk. And later on that day, anybody who, you know, after the Autism Speaks walk or whatever else you're doing, Come to our Ascend holiday party that starts around noon or 1 p.m. or so at the Ark of San Francisco. That's where it's usually located. So yes, whatever you're doing that day afterwards, uh, come to the holiday uh, Ascend holiday party. Thank you. Thank you. Well, folks, uh, that's the show for this week. Uh, until next time, I'm Keith Halperin. I'm Will Burnick. Stacy Kennedy. Linda Lotspeech. Jennifer Brooks. And we are at Ascend Life on the Autism Spectrum. Until next time, happy holidays. Happy holidays!